Patrice Hemery Lumumba was born on 2nd July in Onalua, Belgian Congo, in the present-day Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC. He was the first Prime Minister of DRC from June to September of 1960. Lumumba was born in the village of Onalua in Kasai province, Belgium, Congo. He came from the Batetela ethnic group. He attended a missionary school and later went on to work in Kindu Port MPN, where he became an active member of the Evolues, translated in English to mean Western educated Africans. He also applied to become a Belgian citizen and was also known for writing essays for Congolese journals. Patrice later moved to Leopoldville, the present day Kinshasa, and went on to become an accountant in the Stanleyville, which is the present day Kisangani, in 1955. In 1955, Lumumba became active in the trade union activities. He and others were later invited to study a tour of Belgium. Upon his return, he was arrested for embezzlement from the post office. He was sentenced to one year in prison. Upon his release, he became an active member in politics, and in 1958, he and others launched the Congolese National Movement. As nationalist pressure increased, the Belgian government announced a program that was intended to lead to the independence of Congo and elections in December 1959. The nationalists saw this as a ploy to install puppets and called for a boycott to the elections. On October 30th, 1959, there were clashes in Stanleyville and 30 people lost their lives. Lumumba was subsequently arrested and imprisoned for inciting to riot. The MNC then decided to enter the elections and won with a landslide victory. The government of Belgium decided to invite all Pan-Africanists to Belgium to discuss political change. Patrice was still in prison and all parties boycotted the meeting until they released him. He led the Democratic Republic of Congo to independence on June 30, 1960, after the country was passed on from King Leopold II, who took control of it as his private property in the 1880s, to Belgium in 1908 as a colony. Independence came with lots of problems, including a political divide and an unapologetic Belgium led by King Baudin who minced no words during the independence declaration while praising his predecessor, the British King Leopold II. And he said, Do not compromise the future with hasty reforms, and don't replace the structures that Belgium hands over to you until you are sure you can do better. Don't be afraid to come to us. We will remain by your side and give you advice, he said. An outraged Lumumba rather gave a damning speech and he said, I quote, humiliating slavery which was imposed upon us by force. This heightened Belgian's disinterest in Lumumba, whose government was already being opposed by his political rival Joseph Kasavubu. Only three months into the new and independent Congo, soldiers mutinied against Belgian commanders who refused to leave some regions, including the mineral-rich Katanga and South Kasai, rebelled against the central government and seceded with the backing of Belgian troops who were sent to protect their interests. The Congolese government called for the United Nations' help, and a resolution was passed by the Security Council calling on Belgium to withdraw its troops. UN peacekeepers were sent into the Congo to restore order and use force in the last resort to secure the country's territories. However, Belgium did not leave and the UN failed to provide the Congolese government with military assistance as demanded by Lumumba 
and sanctioned by the Security Council. They also ignored the Prime Minister's appeal to send troops to Katanga, but rather chose to negotiate with the succession leader Moise Shombe. Meanwhile, the country was in turmoil and Lumumba got no help from the West and the United Nations. He ended up calling on Russia and the Soviet Union sent weapons and technical advisors which incensed the United States. The U.S. was a strong ally of Belgium and had a stake in Congo's uranium. Lumumba never got the help he needed and instead plans to have him assassinated went underway. One of the ways to assassinate him was to lace his toothpaste with poison which did not materialize. By September, the Congolese president Kasavubu dismissed Lumumba as prime minister after receiving a telegram from Belgian Prime Minister Gaston A. Skens. Lumumba also declared Kasavubu deposed. This ushered in the takeover by Army Chief Colonel Mobutu Seseseko, who placed Lumumba under house arrest and guarded by his troops and the United Nations troops. Lumumba escaped in late November with his wife and baby son hidden in the back of a car leaving his residence. They headed towards the east, where they had loyal followers in Kisangani, which was by then called the Stanleyville. He engaged visitors on his way and on the evening of December 2nd, as they waited for a ferry to cross the Sankuru River, Mobutu's forces appeared. He was captured and another plea to the United Nations to save him fell on deaf ears. He was flown to Leopoldville, now Kinshasa, where he was humiliated in public, in the presence of the United Nations, journalist officials, and his wife Pauline. Mobutu ordered his detention at a military prison in Thaisville, a hundred miles from Leopoldville. For six weeks, Lumumba was kept in cells and that's where he wrote letters to the United Nations for help and to his wife to calm her nerves. While Lumumba's speeches from prison were creating confusion, Belgian Minister of African Affairs, Harold Linden, was putting pressure on the government to move him from Thaisville, where he could be freed by his supporters. Linden later insisted on Lumumba being transferred to Katanga despite a discussion by the Belgian parliament against the decision that would result in his death. They arrived at Elizabethville, present-day Lubumbashi airport and taken into custody by Katengese police and military under the supervision of Belgian forces. They were driven to a colonial villa owned by a wealthy Belgian. Villa Brawl, and the beatings continued by both the Congolese and the Belgian forces. By that evening, they were semi-conscious and had been visited by Katengese cabinet ministers and President Shombe himself. Later, at around 10, a decision was taken on their feet, and they were dragged from Villa Bro into a nearby bush where a firing squad awaited them. The execution was commanded by Belgian Captain Julien Gatt and Belgian Police Commissioner Franz Vacher, who had overall command. They were shot separately by a big tree as President Chombe and two of his cabinet ministers looked on. The bodies were quickly thrown into shallow graves. To conceal their crimes, the next morning of January 18th, the Interior Minister Godfrey Munogo called a senior Belgian policeman, Gerard Soot, to his office and ordered that the bodies disappeared. According to Soot, Munongo said, and I quote, You destroy them. You make them disappear. How you do it, it doesn't interest me. All I want is that it happens that they disappear. And once it's done, nobody will talk about it. Finished. Soot said that he and another helper exhumed the corpses, and he said, we hacked them in pieces and put them into the acid, as far as our acid could go, because we only had two bottles of acid, big bottles, but we didn't have enough, so we burnt what we could with those bottles. 
For the rest, I know that my helper made a fire and put them in and we destroyed everything. He continued to say that we were there for two days. We did things animals wouldn't do and that's why we were drunk, stone drunk. We couldn't do things like that. Cut your own, your own. No, no, no. Nobody could say now, today it's here, it's happened, said Soot. And just as planned, Lumumba's death was announced a month later on February 13, 1961. Interior Minister Munogo announced that the three prisoners killed by their guards and escaped in a getaway car before they were recognized by villagers who beat them to death. The truth was hidden despite international protests at Belgium embassies nationwide until 1999 when Ludo DeWitt's book titled The Assassination of Lumumba presented new evidence taken from documents long hidden in official archives and interviews of surviving witnesses. The Belgian parliament established a commission of inquiry three months after the book was published to determine the circumstances of the assassination of Patrice Lumumba and if the Belgian government was involved. The report was presented after 18 months of investigation in 2002 and then published as a book in 2004 for the public. It concluded that Belgium had a moral responsibility in the assassination of Lumumba and that it acted under pressure from the Belgian public, which had heard for days about the violence against Belgian citizens in the Congo. It said that there were plans to kill Lumumba and the Belgian government showed little respect for the sovereign status of the Congolese government. The commission confirmed that secret funds were used to finance the policy against the Lumumba government by the Ministry of African Affairs. It, however, stated that the execution was carried out by Katengese authorities in the presence of the Belgian officials and there was no evidence to prove that Belgium was part of the decision-making to kill Lumumba. The Belgian government admitted to having had undeniable responsibility in the events that led to Lumumba's death. But it did not take full responsibility and issued a public pardon of the Belgians involved in the assassination of Lumumba. The foreign minister at the time, Louis Michel, said, The government feels it should extend to the family of Patrice Lumumba and to the Congolese people its profound and sincere regrets and its apologies for the pain inflicted upon them. This was accepted by Lumumba's son, Francois Lumumba, who later filed court cases against Belgium for hiding its role in the assassination of his father. In January 2016, it was reported that a tooth of Lumumba was confiscated in the former home of police officer Gerard Soot, who died in June 2000 during the parliamentary inquiry. In his 1978 novel, the Belgian who helped dissolve Lumumba's body in acid described the taking of two teeth, two fingers and bullets from the body. He later declared that he had thrown them into the sea. Lumumba was a man of strong character who intended to pursue his policies regardless of the enemies he made within his country or abroad. The Congo, furthermore, was a key area in terms of geopolitics of Africa, and because of its wealth, size, and proximity to the white-dominated Southern Africa, Lumumba's opponents had reason to fear the consequences of a radical or radicalized Congo regime. Moreover, in the context of the Cold War, the Soviet Union's support for Lumumba appeared at the time as a threat to many in the West.